All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our morning session today, Technological Innovation in 22401. I am Tom Snyder. I lead the Riot organization, and we're incredibly excited today to be talking to a number of women business owners who work in Fredericksburg and have really leaned in to using technology, uh, particularly over the past year, but really even before that, as a way to provide greater value to their customers. I am pleased to first say that this event and all of Riot's activities really are facilitated by an incredible group of sponsors. You see many of them here on the screen, but in particular, we've been working very closely with our friends in Stafford County and out in King George and in Fredericksburg as we try to support technology-based entrepreneurship across the region. I'm going to introduce myself and Riot here in a moment, but before we begin, just a couple of simple housekeeping items for today. Um, everyone in the audience, if you would, please keep yourself muted. We want to be able to hear from our guests and, and speakers. Uh, we do have a chat window through which you can ask questions, and we'll have a, a period here in a moment where we'll have some questions. We're also going to ask some polling questions just on the screen. We want to have today's activity to be as interactive as possible. So when you see a poll question pop up on the screen, please go ahead and answer it. All of the information that's collected can be shared back out later, but all the responses are anonymous. Um, we do want this to be interactive, so we'll monitor for questions in the chat throughout. If you have accessibility needs, you can turn on closed captioning. In order to see who is speaking at any time, I'd recommend, if it's not said already, to put your view in the Zoom tool into what's called speaker mode. You'll see that in the view menu. Uh, and then the, you know, the window of who's speaking will change uh, based on whose microphone uh, is active at that moment. Um, the final point I'll make is this event is be re being recorded. It'll be posted on our YouTube channel later. So if something comes up, it is first thing in the morning, maybe you need to get your kids to school, you need to step away for a moment before you come back and you miss something, you'll be able to go back and watch it online. But without for further ado, to frame today's discussion, again, I'm Tom Snyder. I lead the Riot organization. We are an economic development focused nonprofit helping businesses of all different sizes to understand how new technologies spur job creation. Ultimately, our focus is in helping to create jobs. We have been running a series of, of events and workshops and other things throughout the region that I just described in, in, uh, in and around Stafford County and Fredericksburg. We have been excited to have worked with a number of small businesses during that time in helping them understand where technologies may shift their industries going forward. And we are working towards uh, our goal of opening a full-fledged startup accelerator, uh, equity-free startup accelerator in the region, uh, hopefully within the next year. That said, I met our first guest, Bill Freeling, uh, probably about six months ago now, and have been extremely impressed by what's happening in the Fredericksburg region. And what I'd like to do is ask Bill to uh, make a few remarks and then introduce our panelists. Uh, thank you, Tom. I really appreciate everything that, that Riot has done to pull this event together today. And uh, John Holden and his team in, in Stafford County Economic Development and Tourism uh, have done a great job on this, uh, having events in Stafford and King George and now here in Fredericksburg. Um, so really appreciate that. Appreciate everybody uh, who made time today to, to hear from our panelists. Um, I'm really proud of the of all of our businesses uh, in the region and specifically here in the city of Fredericksburg for what they've done over the past year to uh, to pivot and to stay afloat and in many cases really to thrive to unprecedented levels uh, amid a, a really uh, difficult year. Uh, today's panel is is really a wonderful panel that uh, that has all have all pivoted in their own ways uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that they're uh, all female owned. Of course, we're in National Women's History Month. Uh, so uh, we're so uh, proud of, uh, of, of these businesses and all of our female owned businesses uh, uh, in, the, in the city of Fredericksburg and congratulate them on this, the recognition that this month brings. 
these three businesses are all uh, very different businesses, but uh, they're closely aligned and they're all really great partners to the city uh, as well as each other, uh, as I'm sure that they'll point out uh, during, during the, the panel discussion. Uh, so I'm going to introduce, give you some biographical uh, introductions to the to our panelists, and then I'm going to get out of the way and, and let you hear from them. Um, our first panelist is Scarlett Pons. Um, as a mother, business owner, e-commerce entrepreneur, and artist, Scarlett Pons realized 15 years ago that the items we use every day don't have to be basic. She believes that function should never overpower form. These two tenants should work together, so she designs Scarlet Wear products to make every day beautiful. A student of architecture and a self-taught potter, Scarlet's ceramic designs are timeless in their blend of the rustic and the contemporary. She has two lines of work under Scarlet Wares, handmade and ready-made. She makes handmade items in her countryside Virginia studio and sells them online at Etsy and through Pawn Shop, her family-owned art boutique in Fredericksburg's historic downtown on Caroline Street. Uh, to keep up with demand and reach more people with her work, Scarlett's designed a line of ready-made pieces of her most well-loved designs. She's partnered with a ceramic manufacturer who makes her designs using high-quality stoneware clay. These custom kitchen items feature gentle curves and sloping lines that blend fine art with everyday use. She says the things we spend the most time with should be elegantly designed. Scarlett launched her private label, Scarlett Wares, on Amazon in 2018 with three products. And in 2021, she will be releasing her sixth custom design. Scarlett, welcome to the panel. Uh, our second panelist is April Peterson. Uh, April is the owner of River Rock Outfitter, a specialty outdoor store located on William Street in downtown Fredericksburg. Uh, April has a master's degree in public history and has spent most of her career working in strategic communications and program management. These skills have proven invaluable in business ownership where she enjoys managing the business's marketing and communication strategies, among other corporate tasks. Uh, April served as the president of the board of directors for the Fredericksburg Virginia Main Street organization uh, and has won numerous personal and professional awards, including top 10 of the next gen, champion of the Chesapeake in the small business category, best of the Blue Ridge for outdoor gear shops, and the Fredericksburg Cooperative Partnership and Community Service Award. Uh, welcome to April Peterson. And a special shout out to the Fredericksburg Virginia Main Street organization as well, which uh, has been instrumental also in organizing this event and bringing our panelists together. Thank you, Anne Glave, for all your work on that. Um, our final two panelists are Joy Crump and Beth Black from Foodie and Mercantile. Uh, Joy is a culinary graduate of the Art Institute of, Atlantic, of Atlanta. Uh, Joy began her home-based business, Foodie, in 2009. By 2011, Joy partnered with Beth Black, transitioning Foodie to a brick and mortar business in, in downtown Fredericksburg at the time on, on Caroline Street. In 2014, the duo opened their second restaurant, Mercantile, also in Fredericksburg. And in May of 2017, they added microbrewery Six Bears and a Goat to the restaurant group. Uh, Joy is an executive chef, restaurateur, and property owner with over 15 years of experience in culinary industry training and management. She's had the honor of appearing as a chef testant on the Emmy award-winning Top Chef, cooking at the James Beard House in both 2016 and 2017. And she's actively involved in the James Beard Foundation's impact programs for food policy, chef advocacy, and change. And last but not least is Beth Black. Um, aside from a stint, a stint in Atlanta as an award-winning producer of television network news, Beth has been a Virginia resident since 1984. She's well-versed in the culture trends, socioeconomic and political structure of the state, as well as the mid-Atlantic region. With over 20 years combined experience in both journalism and the food industry, Beth has a proven track record in research, management, operations, and marketing. Um, she owns several properties, has owned and operated three restaurants, uh, and has employed nearly 70 residents of Virginia. Uh, and Beth is also currently the chair of the Fredericksburg Economic Development Authority in a role that she's done really a wonderful job in, uh, in spearheading that organization. Um, so uh, again, uh, thank you to Beth, Joy, Scarlett, and April for being on our panel. And uh, Tom, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Bill. Very exciting, incredible bios. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to have each of you here on the panel today. Uh, as we start, I'm looking, we, we had our first audience poll question as the uh, introductions are going on, and I, I find it pretty interesting. Uh, fairly universally, 
we're seeing that despite technology, people are still shopping from small businesses in person. 88% uh, of folks uh, say that you each have, uh, we'll call them main street businesses. Um, but also there was not a single person that said that they don't believe technology plays an important role in their business, uh, whatever business our audience is in. Um, I'll open and, uh, and maybe April, I'll start with you. Do you consider your business to be a tech business? You know, I don't. Um, when you think about an outfitter, you think maybe the exact opposite of tech. And so that's been sort of the interesting piece to 2020 is just we had to learn a new way of operating. And so much of our outdoor adventure is being able to see and touch it. And it's about, you know, community and building community in the shop. And those were the things we missed. But I think um, one of the things that all small businesses had to do, and certainly every panel, panelist here did, we listened to our customers. And even though our customers still wanted to come in the shop to try on boots and backpacks and, and pick out kayaks, one of the things they wanted us to do was to be able to provide some of that community feel um, using technology. So whether it was workshops or Facebook live events or um, you know, training opportunities online so that they could figure out sort of what we had before they came into the shop to um, you know, shop for these products. So I think that um, you know, we pivoted really quickly to be able to provide those resources while still allowing people to do what they love, which is to connect with the outdoor community. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, we talk in our accelerator all the time that, you know, any company you're in is really not about the technology. It's about serving those customer needs. And so mm -hmm. that, that's fantastic. Um, Scarlett, kind of similar question to you, uh, you know, at what point uh, or kind of where are you in this journey of, the, of where technology plays a role versus customer experience and, and customer value? Yeah, I would have to um, say that we also, or at least me, I think my husband, my, who's my partner in this story here, would probably say something a little different. But I also, since I'm a potter, I don't really think of myself as a tech person or a business as a, as a, as a, as a technology business. But what COVID, and then what we sell in the store is, is mainly art product. And that's always been a big hill for the art community to kind of tackle is how do you sell art online where it's also a very tactile thing. And it has definitely has been changing over the years where people are getting a lot more comfortable buying a handmade piece that they don't get to see and feel in person. And then COVID just really allowed the art community to totally get over that hill. And I think probably for good that people are a lot more comfortable now buying art online, which is really great for the art community. And we've seen a lot of even shows that, you know, craft shows, art shows that would typically be in person have very successful years, a year online, which is really, really awesome. And I want to say like, now that it's been like the year anniversary, the, the one of the questions going around is like, at what moment did you think, you know, did you realize the pandemic was going to change things for good? And I think for us is when um, our community got closed down for a couple weeks, Gabe and I were downtown and downtown was a ghost town. And it was completely unnerving to see no one walking around, no cars parked, all of our businesses closed. And it was at that point that Gabe and I were like, you know, like, no, <laughs> we cannot allow this happen. We need to keep the community engaged with our downtown and with our business. And, you know, from, from that moment on, we worked all year to, to be online, to push online, to remind people to the downtown's still here, the business is still here, keep the habit of, of, of engaging with us. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. And, and Joy and Beth, obviously you're in an industry that, that was heavily regulated in terms of who's allowed to you know, come to a restaurant, how many people can you have? How, how did you leverage tech to, to stay engaged and, and, and share that same message that Scarlett shared that, that we're still here, everything is moving forward just in a little bit different way. Well, I, I think that uh, some of those moves that we were making, you know, preceded the COVID um, pandemic, 
our workforce is young. Uh, that's just by nature of, of our industry. And so you can't be antiquated when you're trying to attract and communicate with on a regular basis, um, a, a workforce that is technologically, you know, advanced and savvy and that's, that's their comfort zone. So we've, we've sort of been pushing ourselves towards that for, for a while. And, and I think, you know, something that April was saying, it's like, desperation kind of led to innovation and so once the once the pandemic did hit we were desperate to find ways to um, stand out with people who were making decisions basically on their phones you know by looking at their phones so um, you know you just have to change your method of communication and and the the images the video the you know things that we push out to them to hopefully attract them in I think that's what uh, we've been on a quest to do for a while. Yeah, I would um, just add to that, that our industry, the hospitality industry, it's dependent on that face-to-face -face interaction. You make your guests feel comfortable and warm and welcome. And, and in our particular case, we believe when you walk through our doors, you should feel loved. Um, and we couldn't do that anymore. So we had to change and change fast how we communicate with our guests. And that became our social media. And so, you know, if you were to scroll back through our feeds, you would see for the first several weeks of the pandemic, we were just saying, here's what we're doing today. We can bring you this. Here's how you order. Here's how you can talk to us. What can we do for you? So that social media aspect, which, you know, Joy and I are not very good at. I don't even have any personal social media that I use. Um, we had to adapt quickly. Sometimes these new technologies can be intimidating and can be challenging. And, and in the introduction, Bill mentioned kind of how special downtown Fredericksburg is in that the businesses support each other. What are, what are the approaches that you have to, to making a decision on a change like that? What, what does that support network look like? And, and maybe can you share an example of supporting each other? Uh, I'll let uh, any of you jump in to start. Yeah, you know what, I think one of the interesting things about 2020 is that there were a lot of um, technological advancements in place that really allowed small businesses, normally it would have been cost prohibitive, time prohibitive, it would have been too complicated, but people put some things in place that allowed businesses to hop online quickly. Um, and, and so I think just, uh, it was sort of a culmination of a lot of things that allowed many businesses to get online when they wouldn't have been able to before. And then I think the second piece, um, you know, so much about our community, I think Fredericksburg is just, it's just unique in the way that our businesses pull together. And it's, and it's not just about us, but our marketers in town, our IT developers in town, so many of these guys like Ramble Type and Metronova Creative, these guys who were also running small businesses, put their interests aside and said, hey guys, you don't have to pay me now. Let me figure out how to get you up online. Like time is of the essence right now. So let's get you up online and we'll figure out all of those details later. And that is incredibly rare because they too were suffering during 2020 with you know, customers pulling out of, of their businesses because they didn't have the money to continue to fund marketing campaigns. So, you know, I, I think when we talk about our community in particular, it's each individual business owner chose to fight, but we weren't in, I'm married to a Marine, so excuse my terminology, but we weren't in the foxhole by ourselves. Um, we had our other small business friends with us helping us fight. And then on top of that, we had our customers who, who came out in droves to just say, how can I support? What do you need? Do you need ideas? Um, you know, and so it was this whole team effort to get us all up online. And I think that's the way that we survive. Yeah, I just want to jump in and add to that, um, that I think the reason why the city of Fredericksburg had such a high survival rate for its businesses is because we work so well and would use each other's channels of communication to let people know that, hey, this is what we're doing. For example, um, we worked with River Rock on one project. So then River Rock would communicate about us. So that may be a whole new audience. We worked with the pawn shop on a project. So that, you know, Gabe um, does a wonderful job with his communication. So that gave us a whole new audience. And there's so many examples of that happening within the city that I think it's what, um, 
I, I, again, I think it's what led to such a high survival rate. I think that it's interesting that you, you share that, Beth. I think we all have products that serve a particular customer need, but a, a key to business success is you've got to find customers, right? And so when suddenly that door is shut, how do you find them? And social media obviously is, is one area. I really like the creativity of kind of cross-promoting across different audiences. Uh, but Scarlett, you did something fairly interesting for those folks that couldn't go into the shops, but still wanted to go outside and get their exercise and walk down Main Street. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you did in your, in your storefront? Yes, that um, what we noticed right away was that um, even though uh, at the beginning of COVID, even though a lot of our businesses were closed, that people were coming, still walking and coming downtown because they just wanted to get out of the house. They wanted something to do. And if you're going to come anywhere to walk your dog, you know, you're probably going to come to downtown Fredericksburg. And we also noticed that people were coming on really odd hours. So we noticed a lot of early morning people coming out. And I think people were just kind of spreading themselves out because they didn't want it. They wanted a social distance um, more so, especially, you know, beginning of COVID. And people were also downtown later in the evening. So we were thinking, all right, people are kind of coming downtown. It's not during the normal shopping hours. How can we still interact with those customers? How can, and also how can we not make our downtown look dead? How can we make the downtown still look active and like things are changing. And so we have these two great windows in the store. So we're like, we're gonna activate those windows. We want them interactive. So we did um, uh, what we called window shopping. Like literally you can window shop the store. So we everything that was in the window, you could purchase online. We put a QR code uh, in the window and we did new vinyl in the window that said, here's our website, shop online, you know, call us, we'll, if you wanna do curbside pickup, if you wanna set up a personal appointment, we will, for months, we were just like, if you're local, we will bring it to you. <laughs> you know, we will just drive, personally deliver this item uh, to, your, to your house. And it was, it was really successful because our fear was like, we worked all, especially all the three of us here, we've worked so hard for, you know, going on 10 years, a lot of us to, to activate our downtown, to bring people downtown. And that's a habit that takes years to form. And we did not want people to lose that habit of coming downtown. So activating our windows, you know, we thought was a great way to kind of keep, you know, keep the community active and give them something interesting to look at and to do. Yeah, it's a wonderful, really creative way to stay engaged and to, and to have that presence, even when we're online, to have a, a more tactile and, and visible presence. So congratulations on that. Um, Joy, maybe I'll jump over to you. It, at, at this point in time, what would you say is the most important just piece of technology for your business? Um, I think that our our customer experience has always been something that we've been really proud of. The challenge now, um, whether you're talking about in, uh, with respect to COVID or just how things are changing, um, the way that people are making decisions, uh, the challenge now is reaching them when they're in the decision-making process, right? Like, so we're hungry, we need something to eat, where should we go? That's where we need to be you know, we can work our magic once they walk in the door, but if they don't walk in the door, then, then we don't have the opportunity to share our product. So for that reason, I really think that, that our, the, that, that the phone is like everything. That's yeah. what, that's the piece of um, kind of equipment that everybody has with them at all times. It, um, it responds to their spontaneity. And if we have a presence that they can find um, by looking on their phone, whether it's by way of our website, which is you know, user friendly on an iPhone or a typical phone or um, our social media that they can scroll through and, you know, maybe salivate on through some pictures that is going to help us make, um, you know, kind of make the cut. And then if once they make that cut, if they can place an order, you know, without having to get out of their car, those little things like that. So I, I just happen to think that the phone, it's, it feels a little old school, but that's what I think we rely on the most it's like attached to us you know yeah it is and, and i'll bet beth that that might also be the same not just towards the customers but but towards the employer the employees 
absolutely. Again, our, our staff is, is young just by nature of our industry. And I mean, it's everything we can do to like pry it out of their hands when they're, when they're on the clock, but that's also how we communicate up to the minute about what's going on with us at the restaurant, with events that we may have going on simultaneously with schedule changes. It's just, it's, it's just like kind of the one Oh one of communication. Yeah. And I would just add, I think that the city of Fredericksburg specifically economic development and tourism and main street has done an excellent job, um, giving, businesses or its businesses access to greater data points that we can't collect on our own. For example, EDT has launched a program in which, you know, it's, people say it's scary. I think it's a way of life where they, they track the cell phone user and their buying habits. Well, I can't afford that, but the city did. And so now the city is going to share that information with me. So then we can better learn how to communicate with guests. So it's not, I, I, you know, all credit to the city and to Main Street for helping us adapt and getting us information that a lot of us wouldn't be able to afford on our own. It, it's a fantastic story and it really sh shows leadership in the city. You're right that it is a little bit scary to some folks. There's a lot of data that's being collected. There's a lot of data that's being analyzed in, in every business. Uh, that is kind of the way that the future is going. Now we need to, to do things with that data in the, in the most uh, kind of ethical and professional ways. But, uh, but April, I'll ask you, are, are there ways today that you are using data in your business? Yeah, I definitely think so. You know, in our, in our business, we're competing against really big guys in the industry. I mean, beyond like uh, retail stores like ours, like REI or Gander Mountain or those guys, we're also competing against our brands, Patagonia, Osprey, North Face. These guys are always going to have better resources than me. And what's what's nice about 2020 is that there were a lot of uh, technology experts that came out and said, I want to support small business with, with resources. So whether it's providing us with data about buyers in our area, you know, we relied really heavily on some of these tools to be able to give customers choice because that's what a Patagonia or North Face is giving them with their online shopping is choice. And so uh, people in our community needed to know that we had the same offerings that they could buy locally. And so through apps that got our store up across um, shopping platforms on social media, uh, Google opened up for the first time for small businesses to be able to put their products up on Google. That is huge um, for uh, you know search engines because now when somebody searches for a particular Osprey backpack, and um, you see that, you know, the, the Google sees that that person is located within this region. All of a sudden now I'm popping up right under REI. That is, I'm one storefront. That, that's crazy that that's happening. But then that gives this community the option now to make a choice to support local. And then we can collect data points on that. So who's clicking on our profile on Google and what are they looking for particularly? Are they looking for gear? Are they looking for clothes? Are they looking for particular brands? That way I can become a smarter buyer to make sure that I'm buying those things that the community is actually looking for and wanting. And so those are the types of um, you know, technologies that got put in place in 2020 that are free. Uh, you know, I'm not paying for those services, absolutely free just to support small businesses like mine, retail businesses um, survive in this market. And so I think that was a silver lining that came out of 2020 that's going to make me a better business owner, you know, moving forward. That's great. Um, before I ask the next question, I do want to remind our audience that we'll open to some group Q&A here in just a few moments. So feel free to start posting any questions into the chat uh, and, and we'll get those lined up. Um, Scarlett, I'll ask kind of a similar question. As you're looking forward, what, what's the next, you know, either piece of tech or strat, you know, tech enabled strategy or anything that, that you're considering uh, in the future? You know, it's, it's um, April made me think of, of a balloon with her description. It's just like, you know, with, with being a brick and mortar store, being a small business, being a main street business, you know, when we first started out, our focus was like this, right? It's the community. We want community, we want outreach, we want to make a name for ourselves here in Fredericksburg and the surrounding counties, Stafford. And once we got established, 
we started like blowing up the balloon. We're like, all right, we, we feel comfortable now. We want to expand out. You know, we want to go beyond Virginia. We want to go nationally. And then COVID happened and I felt like it brought our focus back, like <laughs> back again on the community. So it's, it's this kind of movement in 10 years that, that, um, um, that we're feeling. And the only way that we can really do that is, is, with, is with technology and, and, and using as many resources as we can to kind of expand out and then by, by bringing our focus and keeping our focus here locally. So our, our big thing is um, search terms. And we've been doing so much experimenting this past year on just how we title our things. How do people find our items online? And it's been, it's been really interesting. So we've played around with a lot of our search term and our items, and we've had um, a lot of success with that. And we've had one item that I sold just, you know, one or two a month, change the search term, and we started selling it daily. And um, that's the data that I'm really interested in personally, since I sell, uh, you know, objects and finding what are those niches, what are those things that people are searching for online? And my focus is, is mainly kitchen items. So I'm always looking for those, those, those niches, um, something that's going unnoticed, or what are those items that people are really searching that are just completely poorly designed <laughs> that I can, that I can improve upon and then add my, you know, add my item, my item to that. And it's, it's that same kind of excitement and it's not pressure in a bad way, but it's that, you know, we're, you know, we're a new brand, a small brand, and we're going up against, you know, household names and household brands. But this COVID has kind of equalized that. And that, that's really, really exciting that you can be in that same game as a national brand, but as a local, a local brand or a local business. It, it is really exciting. It, is there nervousness at a small business level? We see in the news sometimes, you know, this discussion of, you know, have the technology companies, the big tech companies like the Googles of the world and the Amazons just gotten way too big and powerful. It, it, is there concern that they just have too much control of your small business. Uh, and I'll throw that out to whoever wants to take a stab at it. I, I think what, I don't want to speak for April or Scarlett, but I, I think we're all learning to play along with them, right? Yeah. It, you know, for example, we just switched our point of sale to a much more aggressive point of sale in which we can market directly we can now print qr codes on the receipt so the guests don't have to wait for the server we can leave a qr code outside so someone can come up scan it get a special lunch menu order and wait for us to walk it to them outside all of this is technology backed by google and so that was a major driving um decision point for us i should say um because because just like april right right at well i want to be you know before REI, but if there's REI and then my name, great. And by teaming up with such a major player, it allows me to jump up in SEOs. And that's, that's very big. Yeah, it's really interesting. We, um, as an organization, Riot is, is an, a sponsor driven organization as, as I introduced at the beginning. And, and oftentimes when we have held events, uh, particularly in-person events pre-COVID, it's amazing how, how much credibility it will give a small business or startup company we work with to get up on stage right after hearing a talk from a, a Microsoft or an IBM or, or someone. And so I guess you have that same kind of uh, just natural credibility when you're showing up right at the top of those lists. And that, that's fantastic. Um, I have a question uh, from John Holden asking uh, about, uh, I think it was April, you had mentioned the availability of municipal data and how that's, how that's useful. What are the next things you know, that, that any community should be doing for their small business owners in terms of you know, data availability, data use, data sharing, anything in that space? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think we're just figuring out all of us would have said in 2019 that we want access to data and data would be good for us in making 
business decisions, but I don't know, uh, speaking for me, I don't know that I put a priority on it because I was so busy with so many other things. And then 2020 happens and we had to figure out how, um, you know, I was already working hard. <laughs> there wasn't any more hours in the day for me to work harder. So I had to figure out just how to work more efficient. And in working more efficiently, you know, I started paying attention and really putting and devoting time to looking at data points so that I could become a smarter, better buyer. And so within each of our industries, uh, you know, we rely on each other a lot. We rely a lot on Main Street and EDA and EDT to help provide us with those data points locally. But I think a lot of us have also found our industry associations to be really helpful in this way. And, and the Outdoor Industry Association has really stepped up for us in 2020 to help provide us data points from other small businesses like mine around the country. How are they operating? Where are they finding successes? What are those data points so that I can compare against my own industry? And that has made a really big difference for me becoming members of those um, industries and getting those data points. So I think you've just got to find data is everywhere. You just got to kind of find and pull from where it's going to make the biggest difference for your business. And what I would tell business owners is make the time to do it. I wish I had done it before 2020, but at least 2020 gave me the opportunity and lit a fire under me to actually do it. And again, I think as a silver lining for 2020, I think we're all going to be better business owners for it. I really appreciate that answer. And, and as we work with companies, we see time and again that there's an upfront cost in kind of engaging and using data, but, but more data, more information almost always leads to some level of automation, which brings back that efficiency that you talk about. So, you know, ha yeah, having really good sales data and time-based sales data with very simple analytics, you can plan what am I going to purchase so that I'm ready three months from now and so on. And so, yeah, it re really, that really resonates. And by the way, that's not just a small business strategy. Every business does that. Right. So, um, so congratulations on, on making that step and hopefully you'll continue doing that. Uh, Don Whitmore asks, uh, what's one thing that you tried during this time that did not work and how to use it as a learning tool going forward? Uh, Beth or Joy, do you want to take a stab at that? Um, we There's tried just so yeah. much. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, we tried relaxing. That didn't work. No, um, tried not panicking. That right. didn't work. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. Of, I mean, you know, there there's some things that we pivoted to that had a really um, kind of short shelf life, if you will. Like in the very beginning, people, I think, as Scarlett mentioned, really wanted to the downtown community really wanted to support each other. Our residents wanted to support our small businesses to make sure that we would um, outlast this this thing called COVID that we didn't know what it was or or how it was going to affect us all. Um, and we, we pivoted quickly to becoming a grocery store um, so that we could get people the things that they couldn't get. Right. So like, you, you know, people were going shopping and they couldn't get cleaners and they couldn't get toilet paper. And we still were able to get those things, uh, flour, yeast, you know, just kind of, uh, and, and, but that had a short shelf life because the bigger chains are going to, are going to change their system and pivot in a way that we could never match. Right. So pretty soon we're offering like, scratchy restaurant toilet paper that and it's like right next to the lovely Charmin that people can get so you know we had to kind of cut that that off but I think it, it all just comes back to sort of paying attention to each other and paying attention to our guests and having really um, specific conversations with them about what they need um, you know people are like super gung-ho like yeah I'm working from home I'm gonna make my own bread and then two weeks later they're like oh my god if I have to make one more thing at home. So that's when we start, you know, doing prepared meals. It's just really keeping the dialogue open. That's, that's what we, that's how we realized when what we were doing wasn't working anymore and we needed to try something else. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so Bill asks, you know, what do you foresee for 2021? Uh, you know, have you seen an uptick in people coming to businesses? Are they starting to kind of go back to engaging you the way that they did before the pandemic or are some of these new approaches really going to stick? Um, maybe Scarlett, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, I, I see the beginning of a renaissance 
in 2021. I feel like, you know, when, when Gabe and I spent some time in New York City and then right, like right when spring started happening, like you could feel an energy through the whole city. And I, I, I'm starting to feel that downtown here, especially when the weather is, 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 is starting to lighten up, it's starting to get nice. I could just feel the energy of people wanting to come out, wanting to try to engage again safely. So I feel like it's, I feel like there's gonna be a renaissance because there's a lot of things that, that we've learned. There's new practices that we absolutely wanna keep. A lot of, there's certain things that we've started in 2020 that we wanna keep going into the future. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be a big melding, I think of old, old and new practices. And there's a lot of things that we don't have to go back to. A lot of practices we don't have to go to go back to, but it's, it's, it's a whole new way. We've learned a whole new way to engage with our customers. And uh, we want to keep a lot of that going, going forward. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the, it was like a, a tested thing. One of, there were so many tests, like all of, of 20 was just one big test, one test after another. And one of the things that we, we always knew and we really enjoyed, but what really got tested last year was being able to pick up the phone or send a text or send an email to one of our business partners right here downtown, one of our business neighbors, people on the block, you know, what are you doing? What do you think of this idea? And that got tested in 20. We just really kind of leaned on each other as business owners, whether it was ideas, projects, cross-promoting. And that, that just really, really built an even stronger foundation than what we had. And I think there's gonna be a, a lot more of that moving forward of that just celebrating each other, lessons learned, and leaning on each other to really just push the whole the whole city forward in 2021. That's wonderful. And I'd encourage any other business owners who might be uh, listening to the panel today, it, you know, if you've been thinking about some of the things that we've heard from these panels, reach out. It sounds like you've just got an incredible uh, community. And, and, and whether you're in Fredericksburg or across the region or across the world, uh, definitely engage. Um, I like uh, what you described in terms of that people are, you know, they're starting to come back out. There's that new energy. People are starting to go back downtown. We were uh, excited with this event to have uh, been able to offer a, a drawing package that includes some uh, goods from each of your businesses. Uh, what we call Explore Fredericksburg. Janan Holmes, if you're on the line, congratulations on, on winning that. Uh, but uh, I'm excited as you were answering that, Scarlett, to see a, a note from uh, uh, Jim Haskins in the audience who's driving from Charlotte to DC next week and has just decided that he's gonna come through town for a lunch and, uh, and a little bit of shopping. So uh, hopefully uh, we've got at least one new customer that's gonna swing by and, and say hello. Yeah, I just, I just wanna let everybody know that Fredericksburg is the center of the East Coast. If you're driving from Florida to Canada, we're the center. <laughs> there you go. I love it. I love it. And, uh, and I've been fortunate enough to, to spend some time on, on the main street. It's just a wonderful, uh, wonderful town and I uh, encourage anyone to visit if you're not local. Um, as we wrap up here, uh, you know, we do have time for one or two more audience questions if we have some that are coming in, but I'll ask each of you, what are you most excited about right now? Maybe Joy, Joy let's start with you. Well, thank you for the heads up. Okay, um, I am most excited about, uh, I think there's a story in Fredericksburg and I think that um, that the, you know, the normal thing in business is to kind of figure out how you stand out from each other so that people will want to select you over your competition. I think that uh, the really unique thing about Fredericksburg is the intersection of businesses and, and the touch points that we all share. And another thing that kind of came out during COVID or was highlighted during COVID. But, uh, you know, I mean, I was looking at somebody's comments and it, 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 it really is like, if, the, if there's a person who's gonna, who's really interested in like 
cool, edgy, contemporary art, then they probably also are interested in, in spending a really um, awesome, like energetic day outdoors, and then maybe grabbing a bite to eat somewhere where the food feels like clean and healthy and fresh and seasonal. And so that same person is going to go to pawn shop and then they're going to go to River Rock and then hopefully they'll, they'll grab a bite at Foodie. And, and that story all takes place in Fredericksburg because of all the things that we offer on all those different levels. So I'm excited that, um, that we found a place to connect uh, the businesses within each other and then just downtown story all together. Hopefully we can bring people in and, and they can experience it from top to bottom um, on a regular basis rather than, rather than kind of skipping over us and going to where they think that there's more choices and more, you know, it's really just about like that one through line that makes us all feel connected. I think it happens personally and in business in Fredericksburg. Super, thank you. And uh, Beth, I'm gonna ask you the same, what are you most excited about? But I'll also note to the audience, we've launched another poll question. So uh, while you're listening to Beth's answer, please go ahead and answer that as well. Uh, thank you. Um, there's two things. Um, on a professional level, I am very excited. A um, little bit of news here, but Joy and I have been picked up um, by Gold Belly for national distribution for our foods, which is a huge accomplishment. Only, you know, select chefs are, are chosen for that. And what Gold Belly wants is a dish that belongs to Fredericksburg, and that is Rosie's Fried Chicken. And it's just, it's something that we use back in the day as a way to get people through our tiny little door, you know, just to like come in and, and have a meal with us. So we're excited about that. And then the one thing that COVID has taught me is like just to breathe and do what we want to do. So personally, like I love where it, it's just allowing us to be us again. Like the menu's not as big. It's what Joy wants to offer. It's paired with the beer that I like. And, and it just feels more like us. And so I like adapting back to who we were when we first started this. It's wonderful, great silver linings. April, let's go over to you. What are you most excited about? Yeah, I completely agree with Beth and Joy on everything. And you know, from a professional standpoint on our end, I am so excited to see the outdoor industry exploding. I mean, you know, I feel like we've spent the last seven years of our business um, trying to push um, our community to understanding that there is an outdoor recreational economy right here in Fredericksburg. And I, and I know it's difficult because we aren't like the West Coast where you look outside and see these big mountains and, and it's just in your face and obvious. But what we've always believed is that Fredericksburg has amazing outdoor resources and there's, there's healing power in the outdoors. Um, and we all need... Uh, I, I'll speak for myself. I need to get out. COVID was not good for me on the eating front. Um, I supported all of my restaurant owners and I ate a ton. So whether it's exercising outdoors, seeking mental health outdoors, you know, and I think that the city can really benefit from um, exploring ways to continue connecting people to our outdoor resources. And so it's super exciting for me to be the outfitter in town, um, watching people find trails in the river and and all the wonderful things that our region has to offer um, in the outdoors. Super, all right, Scarlett, over to you. What, do you, what has you excited? Oh boy, um, well, I guess one thing, one thing that we're very excited about is um, it was mentioned in our, in our little intro is that we are, we're getting ready to launch our, our sixth item on Amazon. And we launched our fifth one last year and our sixth one this year. And we're just so excited about that because for a while there, we didn't know if we were going to be able to continue with our launch plans. And so we're excited that we we're able to just fight through last year and get our, our, our one of our items launched and that we we're able to again kind of fight through this year and, and continue that. So, you know, we opened up our business at the height of the recession and then we hit our 10 year at COVID. So we're on a great, you know, we're, on a, we're hitting all those <laughs> every anniversary. And yeah. another thing that I'm, so it, it, it's, it's been a, a, a big, a big scary test. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to being like, all right, we, you know, we've been through these two big things. Like let's, let's try to relax a little bit now, but I think like um, 
uh, Joy was saying that just relaxing just doesn't go well for us. <laughs> just, we can't do it. Uh, another thing we're like super excited about is we're really excited to bring art festivals back to Fredericksburg. And we miss that. And I think a lot like a lot like food, a lot like the outdoors, the art festivals are very healing for people. It's a way for, for to bring a lot of diversity downtown, for people to connect with each other. Um, our art festival events are, are never about really selling. It's just about connecting people to art and to creativity and giving people an opportunity to come out of their home studios, their garage studios, their basement studios, their kitchen studios, and to come out downtown and, and show off what they do. So we're really looking forward to, to bringing that back to the city. That's great. And, and one of the poll questions that we just asked was about when are people going to be comfortable going to out, outdoor events, in-person events, and, and so on. And, and uh, you know, predominantly folks are, are ready now or as soon as they get a vaccine, um, with, with a few folks saying, well, maybe we need to wait a little bit longer. So uh, I think it's coming. We're seeing that early energy, as you mentioned before, people starting to come out. And uh, we're very excited about that. But uh, some, some great takeaways from today's talk. Uh, I think my, perhaps my favorite one that we heard multiple times is just sitting back and relaxing is not the way that you run a business. Uh, but, um, but, but certainly being open and willing to consider how to use technology, how to use data, how to connect with your customers in a more authentic way, in a more meaningful way for the things that they need. Uh, it, it's really impressive what each of you have done. Congratulations for your efforts. Congratulations for the, the recent awards. And uh, we hope to see more and more of each of you and your businesses as they continue to grow and thrive going forward. Um, so thanks so much, uh, Joy and Beth and April and Scarlett for being with us here today. Just a couple of, of closing remarks. We do have more activity in the region that is coming up. Uh, Tuesday, May 25th, we're gonna do another uh, virtual event project next looking and exploring smart technology and entrepreneurship in the region. Again, this is in partnership with our great friends at Stafford County Economic Development. Uh, John Holden and others, I think, are on the line. And it looks like Caroline just put the registration link in the chat. Again, this is a free event. We would love to have everyone turn out uh, to that event. Uh, we hope ourselves to be in person up in the region for that. So uh, if we have the ability to uh, take some side meetings and, and so on while we're up there. Uh, please let us know, we'd, we'd love to get together. Um, we also have a project that's going on right now uh, where we're working with a number of partners around building solutions for government. We talked about how important it was that Fredericksburg created a, a portal for small businesses to access data that was useful to them. Uh, you know, some of it's, uh, I'm sorry, government can't do everything themselves. And so we're working to crowdsource folks that want to build augmented reality solutions for our municipalities in areas of tourism in areas of workforce development in areas of uh, public safety and first response and, and uh, other areas. So if you're interested in that, please go to riot.org. We're going to be giving away about $40,000 uh, to a number of companies to build out new augmented reality solutions. Maybe we can find some way to create even more compelling online content for Scarlet Store to be able to see maybe in 3D what these foods might look like from foodie or uh, things that you would buy from a store shop, from the pawn shop and so on. Um, if you have any of those ideas, please apply. We're taking applications to that program now. But without further ado, again, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Bill, for opening your main street to the virtual world this morning. And uh, thanks to, to everyone. If you have any questions after the event, you can reach out to Caroline Griffin. Her contact information is here on the screen. And again, you can go back and, and watch this video on our YouTube channel. It will be posted shortly. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good thanks. job, Tom. Good job, panelists.